Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz here, your host again once more for this episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. I have a wonderful episode for you today. We are, of course, learning some new observances, learning a bit of history. Also have a brand new list of Christmas movies for you to check out this week and another Spanish word for you to practice. And don't forget that there are daily Zooms provided for you every day by the Discovery Educational Team. Now let's not delay any further. Let's go ahead and start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is the winter solstice. The winter solstice is the shortest day and the longest night of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. It occurs annually between December 20th and December 23rd. The winter solstice is marked by the point at which the North Pole is at its furthest from the Sun during its yearly orbit around the Sun. It will be approximately 23 degrees away from the Sun. Despite the temperature outside, the winter solstice is considered the astronomical beginning of winter. Meteorological winter begins December 1st and lasts until the end of February. It is marked by the coldest average temperatures during the year. Depending on how far north a person is in the Northern Hemisphere during the winter, their day can range from 9 hours to absolutely no sunrise at all. On the bright side, the days will gradually become longer in the Northern Hemisphere until the summer solstice in June. In the Southern Hemisphere, this same day marks the summer solstice in the Southern Hemisphere's longest day of the year. The vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox conventionally mark the beginning of spring and fall respectively and occur when night and day are approximately equal in length. Around the world since ancient times to modern day, celebrations, festivals, rituals, holidays, recognizing the winter solstice have varied from culture to culture. So how do we observe the winter solstice? Well, winter lovers enjoy the shortest day of the year. Those longing for more sunlight, prepare to celebrate. Longer days are ahead. Do you like the winter season, friends? What's your favorite season? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance for today is Humbug Day. Humbug Day on December 21st recognizes the Ebenezers, the Scrooges, the Grinches, and the Conundrums who suck the joy out of the holiday season. Sometimes even the most joyous of us all gets bitten by the humbug. Regardless, it's essential to do our best to remember all those who suffer from it the most. Spread some joy their way and bring the holiday spirit into their lives. However, the day was created to express our frustrations, to let the Scrooge in all of us out and let him reveal himself. Whether we declare it through a humbug or two or just avoid people-y places, the day gives us a break from the hustle and bustle of activity that comes with the season. It's a stressful time of year for many reasons. Some of us may be lonely and others may feel pressure to do more than is humanly possible. We may also set our expectations quite too high. As a result, the stresses of the holiday season pile up, leaving us feeling a bit like, you know, Scrooge. So how do we observe Humbug Day? The day is an excellent time to both express our Scroogeiness and also take stock of our expectations. Perhaps there's room to simplify this holiday and lessen our load. When we do, we might find a way to replenish our joy and spread a little too. So how do you feel about this Christmas season, Discovery Learners? Do you feel a little humbuggery coming your way? Do you feel a little bit like Grinch? Or do you just love and enjoy it? Let me know how you feel in the comment section below. Another observance for today is National Homeless Persons Remembrance Day. National Homeless Persons Remembrance Day on the first day of winter remembers those of the homeless community who have died the previous year. The day reminds us to honor them and remember the life they lived. Homelessness is a year-round concern for many. Winter increases the anxiety associated with finding shelter. During the holidays, the media focuses their attention on raising awareness and improving opportunities. 
It is an ideal time to garner a public forum for an issue, and local groups are encouraged to seek out work with their local media outlets to publicize the event. From state to state, the quality and availability of homeless shelters vary. The number of homelessness in each state will vary as well. However, according to the WhiteHouse.gov, State of Homelessness in America, approximately a half a million were homeless in the United States. Of those, almost 200,000 were unsheltered. Many of their families don't know where they are. When they become sick or injured and they die, in the ER or in the street, their families don't know. Sometimes they left for a reason or had nowhere else to go. No matter what their story was, they deserve a ceremony to remember them. So how do we observe Homeless Persons Remembrance Day? The day encourages local groups across the country to determine the number of homelessness persons in their community who have died the previous year. They arrange a ceremony to remember them. Candlelight marches, vigils, graveside services, religious services, and public policy advocacy are the suggested ways of remembering. I think some other good ways to observe this day is probably donating a blanket to a homeless person or volunteering at a soup kitchen. Can you think of any other good ways to remember the homeless people that may have died last year? Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today in 1937, the first full-length animated featured film and the earliest in the Walt Disney animated classic series, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, premieres at the Carthy Circle Theater. 83 years ago, on this exact day, Walt Disney's first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, premiered at the Carthy Circle Theater on December 21, 1937. It premiered to a record-breaking audience in Los Angeles. News clippings from the time quote the theater manager Ray DeKern, who reported that advanced ticket sales outpaced every other picture ever booked at the theater resulted in a sold-out opening night. Advanced demands for tickets were so strong that the sales were limited to four per person. More than 30,000 fans who couldn't score one of the $5 tickets gathered outside a theater just to be a part of the historic event. This was quite a payoff for Walt Disney, who had risked nearly everything he had to see his dream of a feature full-length animated story come true. At the cost of $1.4 million, the film had taken three years, 750 artists, and almost 2 million individual paintings to create. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs went on to receive a special Academy Award, one full-size Oscar accompanied by Seven Dwarf Oscars, and its original worldwide gross totaled $8.5 million, which would have been hundreds of millions of dollars today. It was the highest grossing movie of all time until it was later surpassed by Gone with the Wind. Wow, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is one of my favorite Disney cartoons. Have you seen it and do you like it? Let me know in the comment section below. Today, in 2012, Gangnam Style by Psy becomes the first video to reach 1 billion views on YouTube. On December 21st, 2012, the music video Gangnam Style a song by the Korean rapper Psy becomes the first YouTube video to garner 1 billion views. The video's global popularity is a case study in the power and unpredictability of viral internet content. Psy had been well known in Korea for a decade earning awards and acclaim as well as a reputation for controversy. Though Korean pop music or K-pop was increasingly popular outside of South Korea, Psy was not an international star until Gangnam Style, released on July 15th of 2012 as the lead single of his album Psy 6. The video would make him a global sensation. Gangnam Style is a stand-up of all posers and wannabes. Sai observed in Sal's fashionable Gangnam district, though the lyrics are hilarious, it was the video that made the song a sensation beyond Korea. Sai and other performed the invisible horse dance in which the singer pretends to ride a horse and occasionally tosses a lasso in a variety of locations including a stable, a bus, a tennis court, and other locales around Seoul. The iconic dance and remember chorus, Hey Sexy Lady and the general over-the-top nature of the video caught the attention of global audiences. 
Celebrities of the likes of T-Pain, Britney Spears, and Katy Perry noticed the video and drew attention to it on social media. By the end of August, it was garnering over 3 million YouTube views a day. And in December, it finally reached its unprecedented 1 billionth view. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure for today is Jane Fonda. Born December 21st, 1937 in New York City, New York. This longtime American actress and political activist who became known for her Oscar-winning performance in the 1971 film Clute and for vocalizing her opposition to the Vietnam War. Her most memorable roles are Cat Bayou, Barefoot in the Park, Sunday in New York, and A Period of Adjustment. She also plays Grace in the Netflix series Grace and Frankie. Before she was famous, she dropped out of Vassar College to become a fashion model. Some of you may remember, she also starred opposite of Jennifer Lopez in the 2005 film Monster-in-Law. She turns 83 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Jane! Our next notable figure for today is Samuel L. Jackson. Born December 21st, 1948 in Washington, D.C. This American actor, producer, and civil rights activist who won a BAFTA Award, Best Supporting Actor Award, for his role as Jules Winfield in the 1994 classic Pulp Fiction. He also played Mace Windu in the Star Wars prequel trilogy and had member roles in the films Sphere, The Negotiator, Kingsman, The Secret Service, Jurassic Park, and Jackie Brown, just to name a few. Before he was famous, he co-founded the acting group Just Us Theater while in college and later became the apprentice of Morgan Freeman. He was also one of the ushers at the Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral. Some of you may remember him as Nick Fury in Marvel's Avengers series, appearing in the Iron Man films as well as Thor and Captain America features, and most recently starring in Captain Marvel. He turns 72 years old today. Happy birthday, Samuel. Another notable figure for today is Kiefer Sutherland, born December, born December 21st, 1966 in London, England. This English actor is best well known for playing the secret agent and American hero Jack Bauer on the hit Fox series 24. He also appeared in such films as Stand By Me, A Few Good Men, The Sentinel, and The Lost Boys. Before he was famous, he first moved to Hollywood, he became the roommate to fellow actor Robert Downey Jr. for three years. He is also the son to famous actor Donald Sutherland. He turns 54 years old today. Happy birthday, Kiefer! And our last notable figure for today is Ray Romano. Born December 21st, 1957 in Queens, New York. This American comedian is best well known for his role as a sports writer, Ray Barone, on the television show Everybody Loves Raymond. He would later star in a critically loved but lesser known show, Men of a Certain Age. He also had a role in the NBC series, Parenthood, playing Hank Rizzoli. Before he was famous, he attended the same high school class as actress Fran Drescher. He had the opportunity to guest star on her sitcom, the Nanny. You all may remember his voice from the animated film Ice Age. He turns 63 years old today. Happy birthday, Ray! Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week we are traveling to Norway. Do you hear that song in the background, Discovery Learners? That's the Norwegian National Anthem. Now let's use this moment to examine the Norwegian flag. The nation's flag consisting of a red field bearing a large blue cross outlined in white. 
Some of you may notice that the Norwegian flag bears resemblance to the flag of Sweden. That's because they were under Swedish rule for hundreds of years. It wasn't until December 15, 1899 when Norway peacefully separated from Sweden. The same flag has been used since then. Norway is located in northwestern Europe, south of the Arctic Ocean, east of the Norwegian Sea, west of Sweden and Finland, north of Denmark, and northeast of the United Kingdom. It occupies the western half of the Scandinavian Peninsula. Norway's official name is Kingdom of Norway. Its form of government is a constitutional monarchy with one legislative house, the Storting or Parliament. It has a head of state, which is the monarch, King Harald, and a prime minister. Its capital is Oslo. Its official language is Norwegian. Norway's most popular religion is Christianity, followed closely second by Islam. Its main monetary unit is Norwegian Krone. Eight Norwegian Krones equals one US dollar. The current population for Norway is 5,352,000 people and its total area is 148,730 square miles. That's about the same size as the U.S. state of Arizona. Norway's main exports are petroleum, petroleum-based products, machinery and equipment, metals, chemicals, ships, and fish. Its main money-making industries are petroleum, shipping, and fishing. There's a lot more to learn, so stay tuned all week to find out a little bit more about Norway. Here is the animal of the day. Today's animal is the narwhal. The narwhal, or the narwhal, is a medium-sized toothed whale that possesses a large tusk from a protruding canine tooth. It lives year-round in the Arctic waters around Greenland, Canada, and Russia. It is one of two living species of whale in the Monodontidae family, along with the beluga whale. The narwhal males are distinguished by a long, straight, helical tusk, which is an elongated upper left canine tooth. Like the beluga, Norwals are medium-sized whales. For both sexes, including the male's tusks, the total body size can range from, from 3.9 to 5.5 meters, or about 13 to 18 feet long. The males are slightly larger than the females. The average weight of an adult narwhal is around 17 to 3,500 pounds. Wow! Narwhals become fully grown mature adults at around 11 to 13 years old. Narwhals do not have a dorsal fin, and their neck vertebrae are joined like those of most other mammals, not fused as dolphins in most whales. Primarily found in the Canadian Arctic, and Greenland, and Russian waters, narwhals are uniquely specialized Arctic predator. In winter, it feeds on benthic prey, mostly flat fish under dense pack ice. During the summer, narwhals eat mostly arctic cod and Greenland halibut, with other fish such as polar cod making up the remainder of their diet. Each year, they migrate from bays into the oceans as summer comes. In the winter, the male narwhals occasionally dive up to 4,000 feet in depth, with dives lasting up to 25 minutes. Narwhals, like most toothed whales, communicate with clicks, whistles, and knocks. They can also live up to 50 years, although some are most often killed by suffocation when seawater freezes over. Other causes of death, specifically among young whales, are starvation or being hunted by orcas. Norwals have been hunted and harvested for hundreds of years by Inuit people in northern Canada and Greenland for their meat and ivory and regulated substance hunt continues. They have populations upwards of 170,000, thus listing them as least concern. That means they're not going extinct anytime soon. Wow, norals are pretty interesting. And their horns? I did not know that was a really long tooth. I thought they were like unicorns and had their horns protruding from their skull. But no, it's a tooth. What do you think of the narwhal discovery learners? 
Did you learn anything new? Let me know in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the Arctic Pine. Arctic Pine is a coniferous tree. There are about 115 species of pines that are divided into three subgenres based on their type of leaves, cones, and seeds. Pines mostly inhabit the northern hemisphere. They can survive in different habitats, even temperate and subtropical climates. Pines can be found on altitudes up to 13,000 feet. Most pines grow on acidic, well-drained soil. Pines are highly exploited by humans and often attacked by various insects and fungi. Thanks to these factors, certain species of plants are listed as endangered plants. Like I said earlier, there are many species of pine, but we'll be focusing our attention on pine that primarily grows in the Arctic. Now, the size of pine depends on the species. They can reach from 10 to 245 feet high. The crown can reach about 30 feet in diameter. Arctic pines have a thick and scaly bark. A lot of branches arise from the same spirally arranged points on the tree. Arctic pines have leaves shaped like needles that remain on the tree throughout the whole year. This makes them evergreen plants. Arctic pines, just like most other pines, reproduce via the cones. They produce male cones and female cones. Pollen from the male cones will be transported to the female cones with the help of wind. Female cones are green and sticky before fertilization. They change the color brown and harden a few years after fertilization when they become ready to release their seeds. Seeds have wings that facilitate dispersal by the wind. Despite that fact, the seeds have low weight and will be dispersed only 90 feet away from the mother plant. Squirrels, woodpeckers, and other forest animals eat the seeds hidden in the cones. 20 different types of pines produce nuts that are used by human diet. They are often baked in the oven or fried in a pan before consumption. Now you guessed it, arctic pines are best well known as Christmas trees. And the pine cones are often used as decorative purposes during the holiday season. Other than that, pines are cultivated in the garden and parks because of their ornamental morphology. Arctic pines produce resin that flows from injured bark. Unfortunately, the resin is highly flammable and it facilitates in spreading forest fires. Wood from pine trees are used in the manufacture of furniture, roofs, floors, and parts of ships. The lifespan of the Arctic pine depends on the species. They can survive from a couple hundred years to a couple thousand. Oldest known specimen lived until the age of 4,800 years. Wow, that's a really old tree. Ever wondered why pine trees are used as Christmas trees and how it all started? Well, you'll soon find out later on in today's episode. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is aurora. It's a noun. It means a natural electrical phenomenon characterized by the appearance of streamers of reddish or greenish light in the sky usually near the northern or southern magnetic poles. Aurora. Our next word is tidings. It's a noun. It's literary and archaic. It means news, information, tidings. Hola, Discovery Learners. So yo, tu maestra Liz. Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher Liz. And, este es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. La palabra para esta semana es, un regalo. 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 It means, gift. Regalo. Gift. Regalo. Gift. Practice speaking Spanish all week long by saying regalo, which means gift. Regalo. Gift. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week right here on Ability to Learn. Hi, Discovery Learners. Here's another list of Christmas classics to watch this week. Santa Claus is Coming to Town. From 1970, 
This 51 minute long musical is available on DVD or YouTube. Up next is A Year Without Santa Claus, another musical this time from 1974 with a runtime of 51 minutes. It is also available on YouTube and DVD. Now for a newer classic from 2004, this animated adventure starring Tom Hanks, The Polar Express, a one hour and 40 minute long movie and available on YouTube and DVD. Now for a musical the whole family knows, Frosty the Snowman from 1969 with a 25 minute runtime available on YouTube or DVD. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. Continuing with the Christmas theme, this week's cinematic work of art is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's directed by Larry Romer and Kizo Nagashima and narrated by Burl Ives. It stars Billy Mae Richards as Rudolph. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer started off as a character in the Montgomery Ward's coloring book and was a spin-off of the telling of The Ugly Duckling. It evolved from there into the Christmas song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and 20 years later evolved once again into the cinematic masterpiece by the same name. The use of stop-motion animation was magical and gave life to the song. It made it look like your favorite Christmas toys and characters were coming to life on screen. It was my favorite movie to watch on Christmas Eve and I still have fond memories of the island of misfit toys and Hermie wanting to be a dentist. And how that foggy Christmas Eve showed Santa and all the other reindeer how Rudolph's differences didn't make him an outcast but made him special and the hero who saved Christmas. From 1964, this 47 minute stop motion musical is available on DVD or YouTube. Well there you have it Discovery Learners. I hope you enjoy this week's movies and have a Merry Christmas. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that the strongest reminders we have connected to Christmas is the scent of pine trees? It's true. But how are pine trees connected to the Christmas season? Well, they weren't always. Decorating pine trees and using pine trees as decoration wasn't very much liked by the Catholic Church. Even though most of the citizens at the time were copying the Catholic Church for using pine trees, usually in their miracle plays, which featured Adam and Eve. The use of the pine tree in the plays represented the tree of knowledge, and in the plays, those trees were decorated with red apples. Many people liked the design and copied it within their homes. And in some homes, the trees were hung upside down, kind of like a chandelier. Gifts were even placed inside the branches, up and away from the reaches of children. <laughs> That's very clever. But this was all happening in like Russia and Germany. It didn't really become popularized in America until an English prince, Prince Albert to be exact, brought it to the English speaking world. He helped make it a well publicized tradition in the royal household of his wife, Queen Victoria. Ever since the royal family used the Christmas tree, popularity boomed, and the first Christmas tree market launched in 1851. Along with the pre-chopped Christmas tree market, it helped do away with the burden of families chopping down their own trees. Now as far as the gifts are concerned, they're supposed to go in the tree, not under it. Traditional Christmas trees were usually covered in candy, dolls, and toys of all descriptions. Literally covered in treasures. Often these gifts were fruit, cakes, candy that children would enjoy and pluck directly from the tree. This was to represent fruit, not usually found in the winter time. But in modern day, gifts of course became a lot heavier and tying them to the tree branches didn't make a whole lot of sense. So eventually the presents and gifts were placed under the tree. But why pine trees over any other type of tree? Well, pine trees are evergreen. That means they are green all year long, even in the winter. That stands out, even to ancient peoples. During the winter solstice, Greeks and Romans would decorate their households with pine branches to remind them that although it's winter and snowy, spring will come again. The smell of the pine would often fill their homes. 
and this was typically done during the summer. So yeah, pine trees and evergreen trees are usually used as Christmas trees. Pretty interesting, huh? Oh, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Ho ho ho! Don't forget to attend the daily Zoom sessions provided twice a day by the Discovery Educational Elves. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. Ho ho ho, Discovery Learners! Be sure to stay off Santa's naughty list and like, subscribe, comment, and make sure you don't miss out on any of the magic here on Ability to Learn. And Merry Christmas! Ho ho ho!